Hi, it's Mark Owen from Moves Marketing and PR, I'm the editor of Punchline Magazine, and welcome to Punchline Talks, the business breakfast briefers, where I gather some experts from across the county to talk about the day's business news, the views, what's going on, their own business sector, and also what's caught their eye in this week's Punchline. So I'd like to introduce you, first of all, to a fantastic pa panel. We've got Talitha Nelson, the CEO of Gloucestershire Community Foundation, Ryan Hancock, who's a director of Hazelwood's Accountants, Ian Mina, Director of Business West, Gloucestershire Chamber, and wears lots and lots of different hats from across the county, and Laurie Bell, CEO of Cheltenham Trust. Welcome this morning. Welcome to Punchline Talks, guys. Great to see you. Let's start straight away with the news. Talitha, I'm going to start with you because I never line anybody up. No one knows who's going to start. So, Talitha, <laughs> can I start with you first of all, please? What have you got the news, <laughs> national newspapers today, please? Well, a Prince Philip is obviously really key at the moment in terms of what's going on in the press. Um, but I, it caught my eye, his Land Rover hearse, I thought was amazing. He's been working on it for 16 years. We've had Land Rovers since I met my husband, I don't know, 28 years ago. Um, and so we're really passionate about Land Rovers and absolutely thrilled to see the Land Rover is making a, um, an appearance uh, at, at something uh, as important as is, is saying goodbye to him. I think for us, <clears throat> as the Duke of um, Edinburgh, he set up the award 65 years ago and he's been just the most incredible patron of charities, supporting over 800 charities. And, you know, at this time, charities are so under pressure um, from lots of different areas. They've had greater need than they've ever had before. And to have somebody like the Duke of Edinburgh being so supportive to charities has just been absolutely amazing. And he's a, an enormous loss to us. I mean, it's quite astounding the amount of coverage that, you know, the Sun today has a double page pullout of, of all the different where everyone is walking, all the different positions that they're going to be in, who's who. The papers have really gone for it. They love this type of thing, don't they? Um, have you pick, picked anything else out, uh, Talitha? Anything else that caught your eye this morning? Yeah, there was something interesting. Um, I have to say, it was slightly alarming um, about the 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 dead the the, the let me just um, the Dead Sea. Now, the Dead Sea's death. I just was reading this article and was, it's slightly horrific. It's one of the first nations that may actually lose water. And that's really concerning because I always see um, whether the wars in the world um, will eventually be over water. Um, <clears throat> And it's so awful that as the sea is dying, these enormous holes are appearing and swallowing up buildings and land. Um, and essentially it's this mix of the population having had huge regional conflicts, chronic industrial and agricultural mismanagement, and now climate change. And it's just absolutely frightening. So for me, climate change and the environment, um, there's so much coming through that actually, uh, you know, no matter how much we grow industry and grow our world of economies and business, it's going to have to be a new economy. And I'm not sure growth is, a, is the answer. Okay, thanks very much, Ian. I'm turning to you because we're talking about the economy straight away there. So welcome to Punchline Talks. Great to get you on the show at long last. Uh, Ian, what have you got from the newspapers, sir? Well, I want to start with um, the FTSE. It's heading towards 7,000, you know, record levels. Um, looking at the mayor, and I'm also looking uh, at the FT this morning. Uh, vacancies back at pre-pandemic levels. Um, we did a webinar, which you probably saw the other day, with Mark Beresford-Smith, who is the uh, chief economics guy at HSBC. A bloke who's actually blind as well. And I was astounded what he was saying, what he's really saying, it's reflected in a lot of the papers today, is that Despite the pandemic, we're heading for 6% growth and there's a pent up demand to spend. And I think we're uh, accumulating something like $20 billion a month in our bank accounts. Now, I don't know if you're spending any of that, Mark, uh, as yet, but I think it's, it's pretty good news. Well, um, a lot of money on hats, actually. But, uh, but there you go, that's my biggest <laughs> concern. We know um, there. The other, the other story that I think is interesting is the situation with the health service and the waiting lists. You know, just looking at the Telegraph story here, one in 10 faces at least a year's wait for hospital care. 
you know, this is uh, a very, very worrying story. And the Daily Mail have done a leader on this this morning, uh, saying that basically there's got to be a, a, a proper plan for this. But of course, the Mail have also been leading the charge to open up the economy more. Yeah. And Boris yesterday said, look, we're going to uh, do what it takes to pay for all this. And that, just a, a very light story that uh, those of us with kids will remember. Do you know Cuthbert the Caterpillar? Uh, Marks and Spencer's Cuthbert <laughs> now got a challenge from the Aldi lookalike. You can't believe this, but uh, m and are actually taking Aldi to court. Over. But, uh, no, I, actually, I've got, to stop, I've got to stop you there, Ian. I, I totally agree with, with m and because Cuthbert the Caterpillar is very, very popular. And, um, you know, I mean, we, we buy, don't be serious. We buy it for my mother-in-law's birthday all the time for her. And, uh, you know, I won't say how old she is, but but for Aldi to come in, it's a bit like that story years ago with the with the chocolate penguins. Can you remember that? With, yeah, yeah. Like, came in with their own puffing the penguin or whatever it was. And really, it's a, it's a blatant rip-off, really, isn't it? Don't you think? It's, it's a good story. And when, you know, newspapers like some lightness and just want to end on what I think are really moving pictures of Prince Charles looking at all the flowers. This is on the front of the Times. Um, and several of the papers have got a story about all the complaints that viewers have been making to Ofcom. But 110,000 about the huge amount of coverage that the BBC has, has been giving. Uh, I think that's absolute rubbish. I think we all love the Royals. This is a major event. And as Talith has said, it is absolutely intriguing how Philip pre-planned his funeral, the special Land Rover, uh, all his insignias. And I like the fact that a couple of his um, uh, original family are invited to the wedding. Yeah, that's a nice touch, isn't it? The German side of the family. Uh, are, are, have been invited because lots of people, let's be honest about it, don't really know that that sort of side of the story. Either. Absolutely. So, uh, and he fought really hard to get the Man Battenberg uh, name, didn't he, as well? So, well, thanks ever so much, for Ian, for that particular section. That's brilliant. Uh, Ryan, let's go to you, sir. But great to see you again. Ryan, thank you. What have you picked out for the papers today? Sir? Well, um, since since Ian's uh, touched on the, uh, the the FTSE, I thought um, I'd uh, I'd pick on. I thought was a little tongue-in-cheek, semi-amusing, if it wasn't so serious, sort of uh, story um, about about Barclays. Where uh, have you ever heard of Fat Finger Trades? No, no, I don't know what that is. Well, well Barclays have been subject to one recently, where um, where someone's mistyped a trade that they're uh, that they're uh, attending to place, which um, which basically knocked off how much was it? Three billion off the value of uh, Barclays um, Barclays share price. Now, uh, fortunately enough, there's there's procedures in place at the uh, the stock exchange to to suspend trading for a short period of time whilst they look into these things and correct them. But uh, you know, whilst the whilst the FTSE is going up, it was just interesting to see that something as big as Barclays can be affected so heavily just by you know a touch of a few buttons. Nice. Um, so it, just, it just goes to show um, just uh, how careful you need to be with um, with computers these days, I guess. No, definitely. I've never heard of that before. I'm glad I'm no, no. shares, you know. I'm just all buried up in Lloyds, but there you go. What else? Yeah, well, apparently, it's, it's not, yeah, I was going to say, it's, apparently it's not the first time that's happened. It's happened in other countries, too, with other trades. So it's uh, it's it's a, it's a known phenomenon. Anyway, um, on to more, probably more um, more topical news. Um, then, you know, we, we can see everywhere that the, this pass, the, the COVID passport um, issue is, is doing the rounds. And, and not only, uh, you know, are, is, is the... Um, travel overseas in in uh, in doubt at the moment but they're also looking at how and if these passports are discriminatory to um to uh, employees employers and, and everybody else and of course it's uh, it's a minefield to try and get a uh, get to navigate through and you can almost see both sides of the argument in that you know you've got to protect people but uh, what about people's human rights and all those sorts of uh, dilemmas so um it'd be interesting to see how uh, how how businesses and, and government um, navigate that uh, that pretty turbulent sea at the moment. Okay, let's let's play devil's advocate here. I'll go along with each one of you. Should we have a COVID passport? Yes or no, Ryan? Um, 
From a practical point of view, I think yes. Okay, Ian, yes or no, sir? Yeah, yes. Talitha? I'm a bit sceptical. The billions and millions they spent on an app that didn't work and, and registering and all of that was just such a farce. I just think if it's spending money and it doesn't work, it's another waste of money. So if it works, great, but I'm sceptical. So is that a yes or a no? It's probably a no. Okay. <laughs> Laurie, yes or no? Yes, from, yes from me. Well, like you're, you're in this sort of event industry, so I'm assuming yeah. that's what you were going to say. Yeah. Welcome to the show, Laurie. Um, let's talk about uh, what you picked out from the newspapers. And where are you, by the way? It's sort of some wooden ah, garden shed somewhere. I am in my garden shed. So I didn't have time to drive into the pump room this morning to get online on time. So I'm in my um, garden office, which I'm not in here very often these days. So it's quite nice to be out here. Um, yeah, the news. I think there's, there's three main themes at the moment, isn't there? There's Prince Philip. There's the economy and what started to happen this week. And then there's still COVID, of course. And really, if you go through all the papers and online, those are the main stories. So what I picked out was a few quirky things within those themes. Um, first thing is on the COVID. I don't know if you've seen, I've, I've got, I, I hate to admit, but we got the Daily Mail at home. And I don't know if you can see at the bottom there. There's a great article underneath Nicola Sturgeon, which I'm not sure it's, it's relevant to her, but it could be, which is about as we've got to do this space, so face and space, is that um, you've got to get garlic breath distance. So what they're saying now is, yeah, this is the way you've got to measure it, is if you can smell someone's breath, you're way too close. And if they've got garlic breath, then you've definitely, definitely got to move until you don't smell the garlic. Now, actually, I think that's quite a good way of, of measuring whether or not we're too close to somebody. Um, and also a good excuse to get your distance away from somebody that smells. Um, so, uh, yeah, I thought that was quite a nice quirky one. And they're saying that's what you've got to do now is measure distance by smell of somebody's breath. Or don't so, eat garlic. Or don't eat garlic. I, I can't stand garlic. So, so there we go. Um, the other one is I've just been educated because I didn't realise it was Cuthbert. I thought it was Colin the Caterpillar, but hey. Um, so we've always called him Colin, but it's obviously the wrong thing. And on the note of cakes, I thought, I don't know if you've seen this, but again, economy. So on the economy lines, big double page spread there. Can you see that? I don't know if you can yeah. see this. Those are, there's me, what no? Those are um, cupcakes. And apparently somebody has diversified, great lover of Bake Off, and somebody who watches that avidly, this um, lady, has converted a whole business into doing cupcakes modelled on people's pets. So the pets are on the right, and then she does the cupcake. And she is making an absolute fortune because she absolutely models this. So talk about repurposing in the economy and doing that. I think that's absolutely brilliant. Um, and then... Um, I mean, for me, finally, I think it's the Prince Philip funeral. And for me, it's not so much what's in the press. What I've been staggered by this week is how different generations are responding to this. So, you know, my mum, who's nearly 80, um, for her, this is a massive occasion. You know, she's getting all, all the friends in her clothes. They're coming into the garden. They're baking scones. They're getting tea. They're doing everything to really make sure that they're going to, to you know, give a dignified send off to, to um, Prince Philip. And they're, they're, they're really into this. Younger people, my daughters, they're off shopping. They're not interested. It's like, oh, well, you know, one of the royals has died. And I, I hate to say that, but to them, it's just not it's not so significant. Maybe it's because they didn't do the Duke of Edinburgh Award, Cleaver. Maybe that's why. But but they're, they're not so interested in at work. We've had quite an interesting dilemma, actually, because we were due to launch some of our music in the park this weekend. And we've had to weigh up, Whoa, you know, is that disrespectful, isn't it? Is, you know, should we go ahead, shouldn't you? And it's this whole thing. And we're not, by the way, on Saturday. We've decided no, because we think the nation does need to be officially in mourning to, to do the right thing to send Prince Philip off. And then we can say, OK, we've done, we've done that. But I think it's quite interesting how how different generations view this so differently and some people are really really into it and some people actually it's just another day but isn't it about your age though at the end of the day for all mm. of us, the, the prince philip has always been there all our lives like the queen we've only ever had one monarch so therefore you know that you know we've always had them a bit like a grandparent so yeah and of course, the young kids—they're not—they're not so uh, aware of his of what he's achieved 
for the for the for the UK. No, totally agree with you. Though I'm totally agree. Okay, let's quickly go over to um uh, to Talitha then, please. And Talitha, can you tell us a bit about what you do, please, um, for the Gloucestershire Community Foundation? Obviously, you look after so many charities. The charity shops have just opened. What's it? What's it been like? So we're um, the Gloucestershire Community Foundation. We're um, a, a foundation that's been around for over thirty years in the county, um, supporting uh, maybe mainly small grassroots organisations, those smaller charities which are the lifeblood of our community. So, in Gloucestershire, you may know um, we've got around five thousand charities, about three thousand registered charities. And actually where statutory provision can't step up or doesn't isn't able to our charities have really stepped up and what has been just incredible this year is just to see these charities running like incredibly well-run businesses they've pivoted within 24 hours when the pandemic hit to deliver services to people that would have been absolutely left out on their own so it's been absolutely amazing having come from the business sector um, to see these charities run like a well-oiled machine has just been amazing. So this year has been particularly um, <clears throat> challenging to our sector. The piece around charity shops, so most charities, their income comes from fundraising and events. And as you know, things like the uh, London Marathon raises millions and millions and millions uh, down to bucket shaking. Um, and actually what is concerning, and as the economy is definitely starting to pick up, unfortunately in the budget, the third sector has been completely left out in the cold. And actually the next six to 12 months is going to be um, extremely difficult as reserves run out and if this event income and various other income streams don't start coming through our third sector is going to really be under pressure and if we start losing some amazing charities the most disadvantaged in our community are not going to get the support they need so I think in the next six to 12 months it's going to be very important to, to rally around our charities um, in terms of charity shops I think everyone is super excited to finally get rid of the things in their homes <laughs> storing I've got five bin bags full of clothes <laughs> that's been in a space which I keep tripping over um so I think charity shops are desperate to get back open um and I think we're all desperate to start clearing out after having not much else to do than look at our homes and 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 do things like tidying so I'm really excited that they're getting an opportunity to get back open and generate money for really really important charities and some of the charities have got amazing websites nowadays as well they've really really turned them around haven't they sue Ryder and um lots and lots of them have great websites you can do they become really commercial they really pick through i mean areas you know that are um of more wealth that people are going to spend more money on those pieces they do actually start um sifting through and actually picking um the the stock for the stores within certain locations they become much more commercial the the way they're merchandising i mean mary portis has done a great piece around charity shops and and just how you can make them look so much better and appealing and generate more income and obviously oxfam has done a real piece around second hand um and actually vogue magazine for the first time they're starting to talk about second hand and repurpose and lots of celebrities are wearing repurposed clothing to events so yeah i think it's a really exciting space and I just can't wait to uh, go car booting because I love car booting. <laughs> yeah. thank, you, thank you ever so much, Tlipa. Ian, let's go over to you then, please, sir. So you wear lots and lots of different hats. Um, you work as a director of Business West as well. What's been one of the main things that's coming out at the moment for you, really? What, what the sort thing of for us, you? Mark, is to support business. Uh, we just got a latest report out. We talked to something like 500 firms in the region. They're all suffering from major indebtedness, but um, there are big opportunities. And one of the things we do, we act for the Department of International Trade in this region. So there are quite big export opportunities. Forget the EU, huge export opportunities in places like India, particularly. Um, and if companies are suffering, um, we've got to help them. Uh, it doesn't mean we give them money but we're also involved with Innovate UK and Innovate UK are looking to support uh, entrepreneurs with great ideas for business. Um, other thing I'm involved, I'm on the main board of the left and I've always, as you know, been very concerned about young people. 
Um, I'm really concerned about the problem of apprenticeships. Uh, I think we're heading for a tsunami, unfortunately, for young people uh, later this year. Uh, lots of companies cannot simply afford to take on apprenticeships. The support from the government is very poor. The Kickstarter steam really hasn't kicked off terribly well. Uh, and we've got a lot of young people who have been displaced in the hospitality sector. I know, you know, some of us have grandchildren at university. We now see universities not going back till May. So this is not a good situation. Um, I'm also involved with the health service. I chair um, 11 uh, hospital trusts on organ donation from here to the Isle of Wight. But despite COVID, uh, it's amazing that organ donation is still actually going on. Oh, and the teams have done a brilliant job there. Mm -hmm. um, so all in all, I think we're weathering the storm really, really well. Uh, but we've all got to help each other. And Talith has just been talking about the great work that the charities do. You know, later this year, we've got 20, COP26. We really have to look at sustainability properly in everything we do, whether it's charity shops, whatever. So I think there's a massive challenge this government has. It's all it's all very well talking about green. If you're not careful, it becomes greenwashing. Nothing happens. So one of the things we're looking at is how do we get SMEs, for instance, to develop a sustainability policy at a low cost. Uh, the government has got to really step up here. So I think the whole issue of sustainability is going to be very, very important. Uh, lots of, uh, no, I totally agree with that, Ian. Thanks ever so much. And talking about um, green and sustainability, that moves us quite nicely onto Ryan because uh, obviously we had the budget recently, Ryan working in uh, Hazelwoods and the accountancy side. Have you seen that kick through now? Is that is that filtering through? Yeah, it, it is, it is um, sort of uh, disseminating out there. I think arguably there wasn't a massive amount that um, that it that it brought. Um, obviously the headline news was uh, was on the well the, the capital allowances front, the super deductions and the uh, increase in tax rates that are are pending down the line. So um, getting you know businesses getting their heads around what that means for them um and and just uh, just drilling into the detail as well because there's a few bits which uh, which are attaching especially to the super deduction which which kind of went a little bit under the radar um things like uh, if, if you sell those bits of capital equipment uh, within three years there's a clawback um that kind of wasn't the headline news it was just the super deduction part so people are starting to get their heads around that um I guess the from what what I'm seeing, the other areas uh, really revolve around the reopening uh, of offices, the reopening of, uh, of of pubs and bars and clubs and restaurants, and um, and interestingly, along with that is is just uh, almost a, a word of caution uh, to to not try and run before you you can walk on that score. You know, I've, I've heard a few. Uh, horror stories really about um, people booking their holidays you know their UK staycations this year at holiday homes or, ho or caravan parks and for lack of a better word getting gazumped where the um, where the providers are almost cancelling their booking in favour of somebody who's willing to pay more right. and you've got to you've got to worry that um, people are just chasing the revenue to repay debt rather than thinking about long-term sustainability you know getting you know almost almost uh, estranging their regular customers in favor of somebody in the short term so um that, that's probably the the word of caution i would uh, i would mention for that sector um but uh, but again it's great news that everything's reopening um i, th I heard that uh, there were plenty of um, outside cafes and bars and uh, open this week uh, almost to the point where um it, it was almost getting silly there were so many people out so again that's the flip side of everything reopening is uh, is how much of a uh, uh, chaos is going to be caused with people desperate to get back out there. Well, well that actually leads us very nicely on to Laurie, actually. So thanks so much for that link. I couldn't have asked for it. <laughs> yeah, that, that was the transition over to outdoor cafes and managing that was incredible, wasn't it? 
Um, I think they're really sound words though, Ryan, because um, for me, I think how businesses have been perceived throughout the way they've dealt with the pandemic and as they're moving into recovery will be about how they manage themselves and their reputation and their ongoing business into the future. So for me, that's been absolutely paramount. I think picking up on sort of Ian and Talitha, one of the things I would say is that the, the Cheltenham Trust is an independent charity. We're a charitable organisation and we had to repurpose last year to survive. We were literally, we would have gone under. There's no doubt, like many, many others that have. So we repurposed and actually opened two outdoor cafes. So, and this week we've seen um, the garden bar reopen with all the furniture out there and the, the pump room now with the furniture. So um, we, we opened the pump room. Pump room had never had a cafe since 1930 outside. So it was a real, okay, let's just test it. Let's see, we know we've got a great venue. We know we're gifted with fantastic outside space. It's a case of what do you do with it? So we started off with two trestle tables. And if any of you have been to the pump room cafe now, you will know that it is, it is quite a major operation there. And we, we within the first uh, six months, we had a Forty thousand customers wow. so it's what opened ryan this week we have been inundated but i promise you we're covid safe i promise you we're adhering to all of the, the distancing including garlic breath smelling and um it, the, the garden bar has just been absolutely crazy it you know literally in the first four days we've sold over 300 pizzas there in evenings because everybody i think just wants out and to do something really good so uh, uh, you know we're not about just cafes the trust we run all the iconic venues we run the town hall which we can't wait to get back open and full of shows again we run the pump room which outside is really brilliant at the moment and the music in the park starts again on Sunday and then inside will open hopefully at the end of May um, and then obviously we've got uh, the Wilson which is closed at the moment the art gallery and museum because it's being major refurb which is great and then we've also got Leisure At and the Prince of Wales Stadium. And Leisure At also opened this week. And I have to say, from a point of view of well-being, because I think one of the things we've got to bear in mind that the pandemic has had an enormous impact on mental health. And I think for us, it's that getting people back we're just losing you there. We're just losing you there on your um, structured exercise. Structured exercise gift. Sorry. It's okay. No worries. You, so you just broke up there at the end there, but don't worry. We are rapidly running out of time, and but fantastic. I am looking forward to going to the pump rooms, like uh, many of us, and and uh, and I, I think you've just done an amazing job turning that around, Laurie. I know we spoke a couple of years ago. We first met when you were first in post and the way that you've yeah. done that round, congratulations, it has been brilliant. I've been watching that journey very, very closely as Punchline. Okay, guys, very quickly, we're gonna have to rattle through some stories that you picked out from Punchline this week. I'll start with Tanitha, back with you, please. What have you picked out from Punchline that's caught well, your eye? Having been in fashion and, and that was my, my career and I worked for Karen Millen for, with the founders, Karen and Kevin, and grew from, a, I think, 20 stalls to 100 stalls with the organisation and a very exciting time in retail. High streets were booming. I opened Cheltenham about 18, 20 years ago, I opened Oxford, so all the regional ones. Um, which have sadly now closed. So for me, retail was a, an amazing time for my career and, and for my development. And sadly, you know, it's under real pressure. But seeing your little um, piece on Monsoon, I thought was quite interesting. So it, just to see some of these brands maybe pivot and change or present something new. So you've talked about the, the, the fashion retailer Monsoon has launched a new boutique concept um, in London, which is quite interesting. They've got a shop in Marlebone and they're looking at opening 30 stores. So I'm just wondering, you know, a brand like that, which became a pretty dull brand. I mean, High Street has become pretty dull um, in terms of mainstream fashion and a lot of disappearing for those reasons. Um, 
Um, I'd, I'd like to see something interesting. I think we've got the opportunity now to really think about how business changes and moves forward. I hope we as an organization have started looking at the ESG and our investing, um, that all organizations start looking at people, planet and profit. And I hope that these organizations have a real opportunity if they are going to change, develop, grow in terms of a great brand and a great offer that they still have those three principles moving forward. Okay, thanks, thanks, uh, Tilly. First, Brendan, we've got to, we've got to rapidly move on. Ian, what's caught your eye this week? <laughs> well, you know, as former editor of the papers in this region, I miss detail and issues. And what you do really well and have been doing well is particularly the, the resurgence of the, uh, dare I say it, the sort of once forgotten King Square and the stories you've been running about the planning and reef and um, just a general point here, you know, uh, too many uh, alleged newspaper websites now are just clickbait. What you're doing is giving uh, credence and promotion to really good stories about the development of Gloucestershire, particularly Gloucester. Well, that's, that's really kind of you. And I'm coming from ex-editor of the Citizen Echo and Western Daily Press, I, I, I really appreciate that. Thank you very much. Ryan, sir, what have you picked out from Punchline? Um, well, I, I was I was intrigued with uh, with Mike Cherry from the FSB's piece about um, exports and how um, small businesses particularly seem to be just uh, calling it a day on exports because it's just too complicated post Brexit. Um, I suppose it links up to what Ian was saying earlier about uh, exporting is still you know there's plenty of opportunity there, especially in the, in, the, in India and and other non EU company, uh, countries. So it's just interesting to see his take on that and the fact that, um, you know, more support is required for small businesses to really navigate that, uh, that, that area. No, thanks, Ryan. And there were two very, very good videos that we've got. One with the, the managing director of ProCook talking about exports and also from Polar Bikes. If you get a chance, watch that. He had terrible trouble with, with uh, exporting to Europe. Laurie, what's caught your, your, your eye in punch? Sorry, I'm going to have to be really quick with you. Yeah, I'll be really quick. Um, like Talitha, I started my career in retail, so I'm fascinated by retail. I was Jaeger, by the way, rather than Caramelin, but I love Caramelin. Um, <laughs> and um, so um, I was. I like your stories about your clippets about the economy as well as the COVID updates. And I think the one about delivery has fascinated me because it's about the behavioural changes that we're all going through. So their their profits are 91 percent up on last year and their orders have doubled. They've now got 7.1 million pounds of orders over the last year. And they reckon it's because everybody's shifting now to having things delivered and they're not putting it down to the lockdown, but it does seem fascinating that all of our, our behaviors are changing. So it's whether it's online shopping for, for retail clothing or whether it's online shopping for food, we're doing it all via uh, digital. Yeah. Thanks very much. And the story that really caught my eye this week, I was actually on my first out sent out on on so we say uh, to to go and meet and greet and i was invited to the new saunders um retail outlet in five valleys and what a fantastic fantastic, what a fantastic shop that is and what a fantastic job five valleys it does and, and i just want to congratulate g first lep for putting a million or three million pound into that, that three million faith in it so uh, and the other thing I, I did get from it was this hat <laughs> and um I think it's rather fetching. What do you reckon? Is it a Holland so, Cooper hat? It's a ready for race. It's one of the sort of peaky blinders, <laughs> that, isn't it? Yeah. I, was, I was going for Andy Cap. <laughs> Not many people would know. Yes. Andy Cap. I know. And with that, thank you.